When PLN Day falls on May Day, it really feels like the red stars are aligning, doesn't it? A very happy celebration day to you all. Thank you so much for welcoming and supporting all of the new hosts on PLN over the past couple of months. With your support, we are expanding our team in order to expand our output, and so you'll be seeing several other hosts in the coming months as well. But let's not delay any longer. Feast your eyes and ears, comrades, on all of the progress that we have made worldwide this month. In late March, a hotel owner in South Dakota provoked a mass protest and a lawsuit for attempting to ban Native Americans from staying at her hotel. This happened after a shooting happened at the hotel involving Native teens, which prompted racist remarks and the initial enforcement of the ban. The Ocheti Sakowin and allies responded in full force, drawing crowds of supporters to serve an eviction notice to the Grand Gateway Hotel for violation of the 1868 treaty. One banner read, we will not tolerate racist policies and practices, and stood as a backdrop for tribal leaders and others to talk about the civil rights suit they filed that cites a policy pattern or practice of racial discrimination against Native Americans. Indian Collective and Sunny Red Bear filed the lawsuit, which seeks general and punitive damages. Indian Collective President and CEO Nick Tilson said we will not tolerate racist policies and practices like those demonstrated by the Grand Gateway Hotel. Our communities are struggling and our young people are up against so many challenges and obstacles. As we continue tirelessly to find ways to heal and support them, we must put an immediate stop to business owners and politicians who attack our people through discriminatory and white supremacist tactics. The Finnish Supreme Administrative Court ruled that Sami people have the right to continue fishing on the Tonoyuki River after they were accused of breaking fishing rules. This ruling affirms that regulations that restrict Sami fishing practices conflict with the constitutionally guaranteed rights of Sami people. The prosecutor, after losing twice in district courts, had appealed to the Supreme Administrative Court in an effort to secure a precedent-setting ruling. The original rulings held that Sami people have a constitutionally guaranteed right to fish in their home rivers, and that limits placed on those rights were inconsistent with Finland's obligations under international law. The district courts also ruled that Sami rights were undermined by the sale of fishing permits to tourists. It is long past due for all Indigenous rights and responsibilities to their lands and waters to be respected and upheld by all. Round of applause for Chris Smalls all. Led by incredibly dedicated people like Smalls, Amazon workers in Staten Island formed the first Amazon labor union in the US, striking the first of what we hope will be many victories against asshat billionaire Jeff Bezos. This campaign was truly grassroots. They funded the work through GoFundMe, and Smalls said that he slept at the bus station to catch workers going to and from work to sign them up. He and others spread the word in break rooms and at low-key barbecues outside the warehouse. In the end, their approach succeeded, where far bigger, wealthier, and more established unions have fallen short. It's sending a wake-up call to the rest of the labor movement, said Mark Diamondstein, the president of the American Postal Workers Union. We have to be homegrown, we have to be driven by workers to give ourselves the best chance. This is a landmark win for organized labor, which has for years tried to organize Amazon warehouse and delivery workers. And for Bezos, Smalls had some choice words. We want to thank Jeff Bezos for going to space because when he was up there, we were signing people up. Yeah, we were down there, and this incredible victory in the US has inspired Teamsters Canada in Alberta to reignite their unionizing efforts in an Amazon fulfillment center in South Edmonton. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters, a trade union of more than a million members in the United States and Canada, has made organizing Amazon a top priority, says Bernie Haggerty, an agent with the Teamsters Local Union 362. This is Teamsters 362's second attempt at forming a union at the Alberta warehouse after failing to secure a 40% base for a union vote in 2021. There couldn't be a more opportune moment to try again, said Haggerty. What happened in New York is a real motivation for us, and we want to strike as quickly as we can now. Major solidarity with all warehouse workers looking to keep this momentum going. On the 28th of March, around 50 million workers throughout India began a nationwide two-day strike to protest against the government's economic policies and press their demands for improved rights for workers and farmers. The strike was organized by a dozen labor unions that are demanding that the government stop rising unemployment, scrap the 12-hour workday, provide universal social security coverage, increase minimum wages for workers, provide equal pay for equal work, stop the privatization of public sector banks and all state assets. 
Communist Party of India Marxist MP Jana Daspadia said Air India to airports, everything is being privatized. What is the meaning of parliament, MPs and ministers when the government will not do anything for the public? As long as BJP will keep pushing its own free will, we will keep protesting. To give just one example of the tenacity of these strikes, when the military attempted to stop the strike, port workers managed to prevent the departure of military ships from the port by jumping into the sea. Show them how it's done, comrades. Your dedication is contagious. Self-employed lorry drivers in Spain held a 12-day strike this month. Dozens of tractors drove slowly towards the Spanish capital to protest high fuel prices, as well as lowered produce revenue and increased fertilizer costs for farmers. After 12 hours of negotiations, Spain's government announced that it would discount 20 cents per liter of gas for lorries as part of a package of measures, which will equal about 700 euros of savings per vehicle per month. The government said it would also provide 450 million euros in direct financial aid to road haulage businesses, as well as special credit terms. But the Platform for Defense of the Road Transport Sector called on its members to continue their strike and to attend the street protest in Madrid. The group is not affiliated with Spain's larger national trucking associations or road haulage companies and did not enter negotiations with the Spanish government. Activists said they would not budge from their wider demands, which include forcing down the prices of freight and better working conditions for truckers. After 12 days, we are not going to throw in the towel. It's now or never, the platform said on its Facebook page. Buena suerte, camaradas! After two years of organizing efforts, the Colectivo Coffee Workers vote to form the country's largest café union has finally been certified, following months of egregious delays by management. The National Labor Relations Board issued its final decision, reiterating Colectivo employees properly elected the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Number 494. Their union represents 400 Colectivo workers across 20 stores in two states. The decision means the time has come for the company to start negotiating a contract. Colectivo Coffee is a typical neoliberal nightmare company touting progressive values publicly while also using typical anti-union tactics against its workers. This win is a massive blow to anti-union efforts in the coffee industry and will likely inspire similar campaigns at bigger chains. And we'll be here to gleefully report on it all. After years of steadfast organizing, the MIT Graduate Student Union won a major victory this month as 66% of about 3,800 eligible graduate students voted in favor of unionization. The MIT GSU was formed underground in 2018 and ran public-facing issue campaigns that made gains on many fronts. They went public in 2021 with a major rally and a few months later their card signing campaign hit a majority. Despite a severe union busting campaign by MIT, including dorms threatening to evict them for knocking on doors to spread the word about the union, the organizers prevailed. Thanks to an important 2016 NLRB ruling, graduate teaching and research assistants are to be recognized as workers, not students, which MIT and several other universities were dead set against. In this context, we're seeing a steep rise in grad student unionizing and not a minute too soon. Some of the issues that pushed MIT grads to unionize include housing costs, healthcare and dental coverage, equity issues for many marginalized groups, unfair international student policies, and the general right to have a voice in the workplace. Incredible work, comrades, proving yet again that the union makes us strong. Red feminist firebrand Fiona Nick Ferguson of People Before Profit Ireland has successfully passed a motion securing £181,878 for vital welfare services for working class and unemployed people done dirty by state and private actors. Founded by Irish Marxists, People Before Profit is a broad anti-sectarian coalition with representation in both the Doyle and Stormont assemblies as well as numerous city councils across the island including three councillors in Belfast. They will be running 12 candidates in the upcoming assembly elections, making it their biggest intervention yet. While they're confident they will increase their representation, that isn't a goal unto itself. Organizers say that they run in elections not because they have any illusions about the bourgeois parliamentary system, but because elections are an important time for engaging with the public as they are times when people are most up for having political conversations and learning about how things work. Elections also provide a platform to insert important socialist ideas into national discourse and allow cadre members to gain experience engaging with the public and building a presence in communities. 
For the first time, they have candidates in each of the four Belfast wards, including Sifo Sabanda in South Belfast, a housing and immigrants rights activist who came to prominence over the BLM demos in 2020. Sifo will be the first black candidate to run for a seat in Stormont in its entire history. The launch meeting for Sifo's campaign this month brought together a range of activists as well as veteran socialists and trade unionists, LGBTQ plus people, and members of the various immigrant communities which make South Belfast one of the most diverse in the province. Organizers feel that whatever the outcome, they're still making history and bringing people together. After going on strike for nearly three months last fall, workers at the Kansas City Kellogg's Cheez-It plant have won a new contract that delivers more than 15% wage increases over three years. In addition to the wage increase, workers won several other crucial items, including improvements for new hires like a faster track to full pay and full health insurance after only 30 days of employment. Fordham University sociologist Chris Romberg said the recent upsurge in strike activity has reminded employers that the threat of a strike is a realistic possibility, and workers in general can gain leverage from that. PLN will toast to that. In Florence, Italy, GKN workers and allies took to the streets again at the end of March, holding a major rally in March towards Piazza Santa Croce. We reported on the first major GKN strike and protest action back in September of 2021, which drew 40,000 people who were furious about bosses trying to fire 422 workers during the pandemic, despite the factory doing quite well. While the Labour Court of Florence sided with the workers, their grievances around the greed and arrogance of the bosses continue, so GKN workers have united with workers across multiple industries to protest in defense of the right to decent working conditions. With major strikes and demonstrations popping off every month in Italy, Mario Draghi and the Italian capitalists must be trembling in their Armani boots. Students are back in class as Sacramento City Unified School District officials forged an agreement with teachers and employees to end a strike that had closed classrooms since March 23rd. Teachers and workers were on strike for more than a week, citing ongoing staffing shortages that resulted in overcrowded classrooms and buses, and also unsafe working conditions during the pandemic. From start to finish, our members have been united in the belief that schools should be adequately staffed with a teacher in front of every classroom, wrote Sacramento City Teachers Association President David Fisher. Additionally, we were united in our belief that concessions and healthcare benefits were unacceptable at a time when the district was receiving increased funding. The agreement reached will provide increased pay to the teachers and staff, higher pay for substitute teachers, and will maintain an equivalent level of healthcare benefits for teachers. The agreement also states that the two sides will look for additional healthcare options by the end of August, and that any savings will go to fund positions providing equitable learning for all students. Big congrats to Sacramento teachers! Condé Nast employees have formed a union with News Guild, with more than 500 editorial, video, and production employees from brands like Vanity Fair, Vogue, Condé Nast Entertainment, and GQ. In their letter for recognition, the employees called attention to low pay, shady hiring practices, career development issues, and a lack of diversity, among other things. The current workplace culture at Condé Nast allows many people of color and women to be consistently silenced by management. It's no longer enough to play act a commitment to diversity or to apply band-aid solutions to issues of discrimination, said Epicurious social media staffer Kaylee Hammonds. We're unionizing today across the company so that this hypocrisy that currently thrives at Condé Nast can be remedied. Farmworkers and allies gathered in 13 California cities on Cesar Chavez Day, not only to honor the late labor leader, but to ask yet again that Governor Newsom sign a bill that would make it easier for farmworkers to vote in union elections. They retraced a historic march taken by Chavez as part of a series of events organized by United Farmworkers to raise awareness about the Agricultural Labor Relations Voting Choice Act. This bill would give farmworkers the option to vote by mail in union elections. Labor leaders, assembly members, and farmworkers say they are hopeful the governor will sign the legislation into law this year. I hope it passes, said Anthony Arano, a Fresno area resident who came out to support the march. Latinos need to be heard. We're part of this country, too. A mask-off email from Applebee's executive Wayne Pankratz led to a mass resignation after it was distributed by an irate employee. The email, which was sent to other executives at the franchise group that operates the Applebee's, portrayed high gas prices and inflation as an opportunity for the company to rebuild its workforce and pay lower wages. Most of our employee base and potential employee base live paycheck to paycheck, Pankratz wrote in the March 9th email. Any increase in gas prices cuts into their disposable income. 
As inflation continues to climb and gas prices continue to go up, that means more hours employees will need to work to maintain their current level of living. It goes on to say the labor market is about to turn in our favor. Manager Jake Holcomb, upon reading this sickening email, immediately printed out dozens of copies, sharing it with co-workers and posting it all over the store, on tables, counters, computer terminals, everywhere, and proceeded to give everyone in the restaurant their food for free. In the week after the email was sent, a mass exodus happened at the restaurant. Four out of six managers and at least 10 other workers either quit on the spot or handed in their notices. Another employee, Jenna Willis, showed up the morning after Holcomb's shift, read the email, and led the workers in keeping the store shut down for several hours. How can we continue to work for a company that doesn't care about us, Willis said. Perkance was predictably fired, and some bullshit lip service was paid to the workers from Applebee's COO, but the workers saw these meaningless gestures for what they are. Despite calls from upper brass making promises, most workers have not returned, unwilling to go back to what were already horrendous working conditions. The story spread like wildfire on social media, causing massive embarrassment to the company, boycotts by customers, and warning future workers of the way top management views them. The story is yet another shining example of the barbarism of capitalism and workers' frustrations boiling over into action. I really hope that more and more people see what's happening and see the support that the community has given everybody that chose to leave, Hocom said. I hope that people realize they don't have to be walked all over by the company that they work for. Comrades, we hope so too. Around 25,000 healthcare workers went on strike in Finland this month. Nurses in Finland earn 600 euros per month less than the average worker and 20% less than in neighboring countries. Echoing other unions across the country, municipal employee unions Tehi and Super have stated that low salaries have led to labor shortages, which are negatively impacting working conditions. Nursing unions are calling for a pay raise program that would increase salaries by 3.6% per year for five years. Sounds more than reasonable given how undervalued the essential work of nurses is, especially during the pandemic. As the government is trying to force them back to work, the unions are threatening mass resignations in protest. Solidarity all, stay united and you won't be defeated. Despite relentless union-busting efforts, Verizon retail workers in Washington have won their union election 11 to 1, joining the growing labor movement across the U.S. The workers are calling for other Verizon stores to join them after the company has made changes to the commission pay structure. This makes them the first unionized Verizon stores in America outside of New York. It's also a great example of why bosses fear any amount of worker organizing, as it was precisely the ties between the unionized stores in New York and the workers in Washington which allowed the latter to organize so effectively. Once workers realize they deserve dignity, it spreads. Waste collectors in Melbourne, Australia have walked off the job and are calling for better pay and working conditions. The workers of CleanAway, a private waste disposal company, have not had a raise for three years, and the company has attempted to sneak several new clauses after negotiation meetings with the Transport Workers Union. Needless to say, this is a very dishonest and underhanded move. According to TWU Branch Secretary for Victoria and Tasmania, Mike McNess, when the union requested that CleanAway give its commitments to the workers in writing, the reaction was hostile. Clean away, you can have your little temper tantrum, but you'll eventually have to come to the negotiating table in good faith. In the meantime, the strike goes on. Good luck to the workers. A 30-year legal battle has culminated in a life sentence for Burkina Faso's former French-backed neoliberal dictator Blaise Compaore for his role in the assassination of Thomas Sankara, the legendary socialist leader of the African nation. Compaore, who was sentenced in absentia, was ousted by a popular uprising in 2014. He fled to the Ivory Coast, where he is believed to reside in hiding. During Sankara's rule from 1983 to 1987, he rejected debt servitude to the IMF, increased agricultural production, initiated a nationwide literacy campaign, vaccinated 2 million children against meningitis, yellow fever, and measles, built schools, hospitals, and 100 kilometers of rail, all without external assistance. He also outlawed forced marriages, polygamy, and female genital mutilation. After his assassination, Compaore spent 27 years in office undoing the progress that Sankara had made. Today, the people of Burkina Faso can rejoice in the knowledge that Compaore's treachery is now legally recognized. Let this be a lesson to all those who stand in the way of the people. You can run, you can even hide, but you will not escape the historical record. 
One year after pardoning 15,000 people for cannabis possession charges, Birmingham, Alabama Mayor Randall Woodfin has again pardoned residents for their cannabis convictions. Last April, Woodfin announced that he would be pardoning criminal convictions for possession of cannabis from 1990 through 2020. Now, Woodfin is pardoning anyone in Birmingham convicted of misdemeanor possession charges in the last eight months of 2021. Woodfin has urged other mayors and governors to follow suit, saying marijuana criminalization is still being felt by the people, mostly Black and Hispanic people, whose lives are dramatically affected by low-level convictions. Many of the state's Republican lawmakers still oppose full legalization, but mayors have executive power to grant pardons in the state. Woodfin said he plans to continue the cannabis pardons every year as long as he's in office. While it's not legalization, it shows that the tide is turning and people are less willing to accept the absurdity and sheer racism involved in criminalizing people for possession of a fairly harmless plant. At a time when over a hundred local governments representing a third of Poland's territory have declared themselves LGBT free zones, the first crisis accommodation center for young LGBTQ people has been opened in the city of Gdansk, Poland. The apartment provides a chance for young people to live free of homophobia and intolerance from their families or communities. Absolutely fantastic to see. Twitch streamers Ellen from now on and Pixel Rifts have jointly raised over 17,000 euros for the reopening of the Belfast Trans Resource Center, which reached its goal of 25k. Forced to close its doors at the onset of the pandemic, the center was the only one of its kind for trans people in the UK and Ireland. The funds they've received will allow them to re-establish their activities, which include providing trans individuals with emergency support funding for rent, food, and utility bills, running community programs, and even representing trans interests at all levels of governance, all the way up to the United Nations. At a time when trans folks are under legislative and social assault from growing fascist tendencies in the West, supporting our trans friends, comrades, and loved ones, and the institutions that service their communities is of the utmost importance. In addition to banning Monsanto's cancer-causing Roundup herbicide glyphosate by 2024, the Mexican federal government has announced by executive order that it will replace approximately 16 million tons of genetically modified corn, most of which comes from the U.S., with homegrown indigenous varieties by the same year. This would amount to an almost 60% increase over current homegrown maize production. According to Deputy Agricultural Minister Victor Suarez, both GM corn and glyphosate are undesirable and unnecessary. Given that horrid corporations have a monopoly on GM crops, which prevent the ancient practice of saving seeds, Suarez says that sustainable agricultural practices must take priority. We have to put the right to life, the right to health, the right to a healthy environment ahead of economic and business interests. At the fourth meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Minamata Convention on Mercury in Bali, Indonesia, the United Nations adopted a provision to ban the use of mercury as a propellant for satellite and spacecraft launches by 2025. Though mercury is a potent neurotoxin, it's been used in the space industry since the 1970s due to its cheapness and ease of use. As rocket pieces fall back to Earth during takeoff, an estimated 75% of the mercury in those pieces end up in the world's oceans, contributing to the mercury buildup in marine animals as well as those who consume seafood. While fighting pollution in the ocean still has a long way to go, this is a very welcome change, especially when there have been mercury-free alternatives for years. While caribou populations across Canada continue to decline due to resource extraction, thanks to the collaborative efforts of the West Moberly First Nations and Salto First Nations, caribou numbers are rebounding in central British Columbia. The recovery effort combines short-term actions such as guardians at maternal pens and securing landscape level protection. According to wildlife researchers, due to these indigenous-led efforts, the caribou population in the region has tripled in under a decade and continues to rise. Speaking on the gradual recovery of this herd, Carmen Richter, a biology master's student involved in the research, said we are working hard to recover these caribou. Each year, community members pick bags and bags of lichen to feed the mother caribou in the pen while the other members live at the top of the mountain with the animals. One day, we hope to return the herds to a sustainable size. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to TotalLiberationPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Nick, Catherine, Jacob, and Sebastian for script writing help. And thank you to JC for editing this video. We're hoping to expand our team and our output, so if you'd like to support that, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news, or you can give us a one-time tip or donation. The link is in the description box below. Come on, sometimes.